Всем привет. Это сессия. Hello to everyone. This is the session about the uh, impact of information security risks on the financial institutions' resilience. My name is uh, Nadezhda Groshova. I will be moderating the session, and today we are going to discuss uh, very relevant and important uh, questions. I think you have all noticed uh, that during the pandemic, the use of online banking and uh, mobile banking has grown uh, in popularity. There are some numbers. Uh, for example, online banking, the use of online banking grew by 23% and mobile banking uh, grew in popularity by 30 plus percent uh, as BCG um, reported. In Russia, we have a growing number of people uh, using applications and more than 50, 56 uh, percent uh, of uh, people are using uh, banking services uh, through their mobile applications. And the more people are using their banking uh, um, applications, uh, the more important uh, would be the operational resilience and security of such uh, services and uh, the possibility of getting such services without uh, delays or faults. Uh, we are going also to discuss how this, is, uh, this can be regulated and how banks can support their operational uh, reliability and how clients can test the reliability of their banks and what is the international experience and how can we ensure the cyber risks. Uh, let me introduce our panelists, uh, Herman Zuberev, uh, Deputy Governor of the Bank of Russia. Hello, uh, Herman. Hello. David White, uh, Head of Cyber Resilience uh, Coordination Center of BIS. Hello, David. Vadim Kulik, uh, Deputy President and Chairman of the Management Board of VTB Bank. Hello, Vadim. And Irina Alpatova, Deputy CEO and Corporate Insurance Director of Alpha Strachovania. But before we come to the first uh, batch of questions, uh, to all those who are watching us, uh, please remember that we have a poll in progress, so please do vote so that we can make some conclusions about uh, your approaches and your attitudes uh, to cyber risks. The question is, uh, um, is cybersecurity important uh, for the resilience of a financial institution? First, it is less signific significant uh, than other risks, uh, like liquidity risks or credit risks. Uh, the second uh, optional uh, answer, it is uh, uh, less significant, but is on the way to become uh, the same level of importance to the financial institution. Fourth, it is more important uh, than other risks. Um, and uh, fourth, uh, it is uh, uh, one of the key characteristics. Now, to assess uh, the resilience of banks um, to, in terms of providing remote banking services and prevent any uh, technological uh, faults and disruptions uh, and cyber attacks. And my first question is to uh, David. Uh, BIS uh, is setting the standards uh, for the financial sector. Uh, what is the international experience uh, with uh, setting the requirements uh, for the operational resilience uh, and reliability of banks? Uh, thank you very much, and, and thank you for the question. Uh, actually, I think I have uh, a slide to show, if that's OK. So while that is uh, coming up on the screen, uh, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, to be with you today, at least virtually. And I thought what I would do is just give you a very brief overview of the Bank for International Settlements. Um, we are the world's uh, oldest international bank, but uh, we are actually owned uh, by 63 central banks. We're often called the Central Bank of Central Banks. The Bank of Russia is one of our shareholders. Uh, the Central Bank of Russia, rather, is one of our shareholders as well. And uh, we do have a, a fairly global footprint in addition to maintaining a, a great relationship, obviously, with the 63 central banks uh, across the world. We have a number of innovation hubs that are looking at fintech um, and two regional offices, one in Hong Kong and Mexico, uh, that execute trades for us. But, but very briefly, uh, the Bank for International Settlements is unique in that it actually hosts a number of committees. Um, these are international committees, with, each with their own mandate, that deal with 
uh, a number of different standard setting policies and guidelines uh, looking at global financial stability. And what I thought I would do is just very briefly walk you through kind of two categories of these committees. Uh, the first, if you'll see on the first slide, uh, these really deal with those uh, those committees and organizations that are setting uh, principles and standards uh, for the for the global financial sector. Uh, the first is the Committee on Payments and Market Infrastructure. Uh, this this committee um, has uh, well over 120 members uh, globally, and they are concerned specifically with making sure that the payment system uh, internationally is is sound. And increasingly, what we are finding uh, in all of these committees, I might, might add, is that uh, back to the, the first question in the poll, cyber resilience is definitely now uh, at least among the top five, if not top three on any risk register. And obviously, when we talk about the efficiency of the payment system, the security and the resilience of that system is, of course, of great importance as well. Uh, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, uh, again, is sets uh, principles and guidelines and standards internationally. And here, I would say a number of central banks would then take the, this guidance and they offer uh, a number of things you might have heard of the Basel uh, Committee Directives 1, 2, and 3. Uh, but they're also now uh, giving guidance now on best practices for cyber resilience as well. And this is key because they really try to get the exchange between the central banks, uh, the regulators, and the supervisory authorities as well, setting minimum standards and guidelines. And I stress now that this is also into cybersecurity. Uh, if you think about the International Association of Insurance Supervisors, uh, this is another area as well where they are, again, setting the standards for those that are supervising the way that insurance um, is, of course, uh, practiced globally. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and now we move to the uh, second category, uh, which uh, really tried these committees try to influence um, rather than doing standard setting per se. Uh, one is the Financial Stability Board, uh, which again tries to bring together uh, decision makers in the central banks uh, and, and, and uh, in the political arena. Uh, they try to help national authorities implement effective regulatory and supervisory measures. And I will stress, if you take a look at, at the websites, uh, there, is an, there is guidance uh, without exception on all of these different committees on cyber resilience. And, and finally, uh, we talk about the Financial Stability Institute, uh, where they uh, have a, a number of offerings trying to help supervisors deal with this matter. And last but not least, um, the area that I run at the Bank for International Settlements, uh, the Cyber Resilience Coordination Center, we are really devoted to best practices among the central bank community uh, to do things like knowledge sharing, collaboration, and operational readiness. And this all uh, is underpinned by operational resilience. So this gives you a broad overview, uh, very, very briefly, of a number of, of, of very uh, great great committees that, that are doing either standard setting or promoting best practices in this space for global financial stability. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Vadim. Do banks actually perceive this as uh, very important uh, to be resilient, or is it another requirement uh, from the regulator, or is it another pressure from the regulator? I don't think that this should be talking about any pressure from the regulator. The story is quite simple. The risks that can materialize uh, may cause uh, a suspension of operations of a bank because we might have uh, some disruption in our services uh, uh, that we provide to the clients. And this is uh, totally inad inadmissible. Uh, so this is not a story which is uh, led by the regulator, but it is rather the bank itself that needs to support uh, its clients uh, 24 by 7. And this is our commitment uh, to the clients. We, in no case, can uh, afford uh, any interruption in our services. So we are ourselves interested in trying to oppose such threats. Thank you, Vadim. Indeed, uh, our banks uh, are providing their services uh, also remotely, or you can visit uh, an office or branch of the bank. 
But Irina, uh, the operational resilience and insurance, uh, is there anything common between those two? Well, insurance, there is uh, still a stereotype that uh, insurance companies uh, is about uh, an agent uh, who would bring a paper policy to the client. But this has not been uh, long a practice. If you take a look at the insurance market, then in Q1 of 2021, compared to the same period of last year, the market grew by exactly 50 percent, 50 percent. Now, if you take uh, the third-party liability for motorists, uh, about uh, um, one third of those policies are sold online. Uh, if you take uh, my company, Alpha Strachovanie, about 40% uh, uh, is sold online, but, for, uh, but uh, the, we also provide 100% of uh, the uh, traveler's insurance policies uh, online. So, Alpha Strachovanie, of course, uh, is very much interested uh, and is influenced uh, by operational resilience uh, matters, and uh, that is why. Uh, you know, such a story is no less important uh, than to uh, remote uh, banking services. Uh, we, as uh, another participant uh, of uh, the financial market, uh, are guided by the resolution uh, 684 on uh, uh, the uh, operational uh, security and resilience uh, with uh, two caveats, uh, because we are, for example, providing medical insurance. But just remember, we're talking not only about some um, uh, money implications, or, or we're talking about some serious harm to the health of our clients uh, if uh, a person is trying to get a service and the application is not uh, functioning, and then we might be running the risk of a health hazard uh, to such a client. And also, we are not only prone to such risks as a participant, but we are also assuming such a risk uh, when you are talking about uh, the insurance against the cyber risks, uh, an insurance that we are providing to the other participants in the financial market against uh, such cyber risks. We are going to talk more about uh, cyber risks uh, and insurance, uh, but Herman, where do you find the role for the Bank of Russia there? Well, it's hard to, you know, overestimate the role of the Bank of Russia as the regulator there. On December 30 of last year, we have had changes to the federal law on the Central Bank of Russia, and we now can introduce requirements for operational resilience. And of course, uh, we are in the process of um, kind of like coming up with the uh, proper regulations and rules, uh, and there we are taking like a two-way approach. On the one hand, we are using international practices that David mentioned, uh, the recommendations and guidelines that uh, are offered by the sectoral regulators, including uh, from uh, the uh, Basel Committee for Standards and Payments and uh, BIS in general, but also if you take the International Commission for Securities and the International uh, Organization for uh, Insurance Supervision, etc. So we are watching all those guidelines and are thinking how to integrate them with the Russian law. But we are also guided by the uh, local standards, uh, uh, and I'm talking about uh, uh, the FAPSI, which is the Federal uh, Telecommunications Service, uh, and the uh, Federal uh, Security Committee. We are now developing uh, um, like a, a national level standard uh, for such. Uh, this is the security of financial transactions, uh, operational resilience, and uh, the fundamentals uh, and the fundamental measures that need to be taken. What is good about the, that name is that basically, you know, looking at that name, you understand uh, what it is about. This is basically a package of various software and hardware measures that uh, you need to have in place uh, to ensure operational resilience. We hope that such a standard would be approved soon, and we will be implementing such a standard and a requirement. Uh, operational resilience is at the kind of like uh, border between reliability and uh, your efficiency. And here we want to also establish some requirements uh, to the processes that might affect operational resilience, and the processes would be represented uh, quantitatively. We will be monitoring them based on the reports that we are going to collect uh, uh, regularly, and uh, their actual performance would be assessed uh, by the number of accidents or incidents uh, in a particular institution. 
solution. And, uh, uh, of course, of late, we have been paying a lot of attention to uh, our proper analytical uh, centers and data processing centers so that we ha can have information about the cyber threats and uh, risks, uh, uh, handle uh, such information, uh, process such information, and uh, advise our uh, uh, supervised entities of those. And, of course, uh, we will be talking more about uh, uh, more resilience. We are going to have also the uh, something that we are calling uh, like cyber training programs, uh, so that together with the institutions we can develop uh, uh, a mechanism to counter such uh, cyber attacks. Uh, we have several scenarios now being developed uh, based on some real stories, uh, based on some analysis of the uh, real attacks, uh, and we think that when we uh, operate um, from uh, such training programs, Programs, uh, to some uh, real mechanisms that we would be able to identify weaknesses uh, in the cybersecurity systems of our banks and as part of our uh, consultative supervision and risk-based supervision, uh, we will be providing such uh, uh, consulting. Uh, 22 uh, major financial institutions last year actually went uh, through the testing of their cybersecurity systems and they received some feedback from us. So we actually uh, saw that uh, it was uh, perceived quite positively such a training, but we will continue uh, to do such training in future. Since you are talking about some real stories. Uh, maybe my question is to Vadim. VTB is one of the largest uh, Russian banks with uh, a huge uh, client base. Is it difficult to support operational resilience and what kind of challenges do you face there? Now, regarding the, those uh, real events, uh, real cyber events, indeed there are many of those, and uh, let me probably uh, call a few chilling numbers, I would say, and then I will try to calm you down there. Now, uh, what is the trend? Uh, that we observe today. In the five months of 2021, we experienced how how many do you think uh, attacks we experienced or had? Uh, the number is 1.2 million such cyber attacks. Yes, I mean of different type, of course. Uh, and I'll uh, discuss those. Most of them, about 60% of those. Uh, um, uh, various, uh, you know, cyber probing sort of into our systems, uh, trying to find uh, uh, some weaknesses uh, in our network and maybe to establish our configuration of uh, software and hardware systems and to try to find some open elements and vulnerabilities in our uh, network. So it is about 60% of those attacks. 22% uh, of those accidents and incidents uh, were, were the attempts uh, to use uh, some well-known uh, vulnerabilities of uh, computer systems uh, generally. So throughout 2020, we only had 750,000 such attacks. Uh, and now compared to one point two million in the first five months of this year, you can see the growth of such a of the number of such attempts. Uh, quite a fantastic growth, I would say. So the thing is that the density of such attacks is uh, becoming very high. And this is one of the big challenges. So you see more and more such attacks. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, they're growing uh, exponentially, if you see. The se this is the first challenge. Uh, the second challenge is that we are undergoing a quite a large-scale project of digital transformation and the density of uh, deployments of uh, new solutions uh, is very high. We are uh, kind of like uh, running 178 updates a day. Uh, that's the uh, volume of changes that we have to uh, support and accommodate. Uh, now, anything regarding cybersecurity and uh, cyber protection, now these two trends, uh, uh, the two growing flows, if you like, of cyber attacks and uh, updates uh, actually set the scene for our management uh, practices. And uh, in both areas, we do have solutions. Uh, first, uh, in terms of what we are building, in terms of our construct of uh, the network, this is a tiered uh, 
defensive system, if you like, uh, which includes uh, three echelons or three tiers of protection. And we also have uh, uh, some uh, specific uh, methods uh, that we use when all the updates are developed uh, and designed all already from day one uh, with the cybersecurity in mind. Uh, so those updates are designed in a way so that they are secure. And uh, IT professionals are part of the development teams. Uh, and we are releasing a product uh, which already has uh, all the necessary uh, requirements in terms of cybersecurity. So those products uh, do meet our requirements for cybersecurity, but also if you take the updates of the uh, software code, uh, it also provides for some uh, phases of testing. So there are some elements uh, there that actually support uh, the testing of those products uh, before uh, such uh, a product is rolled out. Now, regarding the, this uh, tiered uh, protection system, of course, we do have means of uh, against uh, DDoS attacks and uh, firewalls and uh, and sandboxes, uh, of course, to see what is coming in in the files that are sent by our partners uh, or in the name of our partners with whom we openly integrate. And also we have a second uh, echelon or tier of protection where we process uh, various uh, events when we identify some uh, abnormal traffic or abnormal elements, uh, and this is a multi-vector protection system. And also there is uh, also some kind of like uh, another additional layer of uh, protection which uh, covers the full landscape of our operations where we use the various tools uh, to identify anomalies. Uh, there are also tools uh, that uh, use uh, neural networks uh, to predict uh, uh, new infrastructural and network elements uh, in the landscape or how the potential vector of attacks may change if a new element is added uh, so that we can be prepared to such uh, an attack. And on top of all of this, you have also the um, Operational Monitoring cent Center, which uh, oversees uh, how such automated uh, mechanisms are, uh, are performing. And uh, this op center can uh, interfere in case of uh, the need of some manual handling. So this way, we can uh, more or less uh, repel all, all those attacks. Uh, none of the 1.2 million attacks uh, uh, were successful. Uh, uh, so they may reach only maybe level two where we, uh, where even the most successful attacks uh, are uh, kind of like rejected and uh, uh, repelled. Uh, do you have uh, frequent uh, complaints from your clients? I mean, what is uh, the principal difference? Because when a client goes to the uh, the office or uh, the offline branch, it is quite uh, easy for the bank to provide such a service in the offline regime. But when you are talking about online, there are many associated risks uh, because maybe a client cannot connect uh, to the application to the online banking. Do you receive many of those complaints? Uh, well, the, the complaints may be many. Why say uh, the application is not responding? It may be related to your poor internet connection. But we are talking about uh, the proper risks. Uh, that's part of the complaint. We have not had uh, a single incident uh, when uh, uh, that uh, event caused a disruption in our access or service. Uh, so we have not had any complaints about uh, uh, the, the such events. Thank you, Vadim. Now we've come to the next uh, area of insurance of cyber threats. I would like to call on the audience to ask questions. And please, I call on you to vote in the poll. Disruptions at financial institutions could uh, lead to losses for the customers and 
for the financial institutions. How can we ensure these risks? If you don't make a payment on time, if a deal is not closed on time, it might be a waste of time and a waste of money for customers. Irina, what is subject to insurance? How can you insure cyber threats? Thank you. Insurance initially was supposed to, to help people avoid fires or to save them from losses uh, led incurred by fires and robbers. But today, life is different and threats are different. So previously, a criminal would wait uh, for uh, his uh, or her victim uh, somewhere near their house, and right now they are waiting out there hunting in the social media to get access to the uh, bank card. And uh, previously, people were uh, people were ro people were uh, taken for a ransom, and right now you don't need to take people for ransom. You can just uh, uh, stage a cyber attack and demand ransom, and it could be a virus uh, in thousands of computers. Or it could be a targeted uh, attack uh, on a factory led by uh, the competitor. So it's DDoS attacks, phishing. There is disruptions, uh, malware, ransomware, and so there is a plethora of risks out there. Now, what could be compensated? These are third-party losses, customer, partner, vendor losses, for any corporate, not just for the financial entity. These are uh, data recovery costs. They can also be insured. The funds that were stolen from third parties or from the bank or from any other legal entity. Also, we can insure against losses, lost revenue. So, operation resilience was disrupted, your website was down, the company did not have a chance to sell their products, and this is why they lost some uh, potential revenue. And finally, investigation costs into cyber attacks. So these are the areas uh, which uh, you can buy insurance for. And the very last item, that's uh, personal data leaks. It's not really relevant for Russia, but in the West, that, that could lead to huge penalties because regulation is completely different. So that's a different story in the West. But overall, that's uh, the uh, breakdown of uh, the risks that we can provide insurance for. So what is the probability? There are three buckets. First, uh, three pillars. So we first get statistics. Uh, we get uh, from a lot of sources, uh, primarily in the West, and from Russia, too. According to the Interior Ministry in 2020, cyber crimes led to a total loss of uh, some chilling numbers, uh, like Vadim said, 450 billion rubles. One year, 450 billion rubles just in Russia. That's a, a staggering amount. So we get the stats from all, every possible source. Second, we look at the IT security framework uh, at the clients uh, on the client side. And third, is accumulation of risks. Insurance companies have learned to do it uh, for uh, earthquakes, fires, but with cyber threats, we're still learning. One virus can hit an unpredictable number of computers around the world. How do you calculate the risks, the probability? 
whether it's a uh, insured event or not. No, I mean, the, how can you calculate uh, the potential uh, impact? Uh, so first, the stats, the data for the spe client-specific data in terms of their IT security and accumulation, as we call it. Thank you, Irina. Vadim, in what case would the bank be interested to uh, get insurance against these cyber threats or uh, threats against its operational resilience? Here's the thing. Definitely, our in partners from insurance companies would not uh, uh, develop this or not grow this market uh, out of charitable charity reasons. They want to earn money on it. So currently, there is a deficit in statistics, but the uh, structure and the level of threats is changing very fast. So I give you some figures. One million two hundred thousand attempts. So none of them successful. So you have a lot of statistics. The statistics are quite high. But, uh, you know, the losses have been uh, minimum. There is not enough statistics because there have been no successful attempts. So what's the price of such insurance? It's really hard to uh, assess this price. And for every year, for the first year, you definitely miss it. We may purchase this. Uh, uh, purchase this insurance, uh, purchase this plan, but uh, nothing's going to happen. Or uh, so we lose out, so we overpay, and the same could happen on the side of insurance. The total market is uh, 8 billion US dollars. That's the total market for the world uh, in terms of uh, cyber threat insurance. So, you know, this market still has a long way to go. It needs uh, some time to get mature, and we need to figure out how our uh, insurance partners uh, would do the assessment uh, before providing their services. And the price is the cornerstone issue. Second, as you said, you can insure us against uh, lost revenue. Well, you can only find uh, free cheese in a mouse trap, as the saying goes. There is still so much uh, non-regulated in terms of what is an insured event. Yes, the list of uh, cyber threats is long, but most of them are hard to confirm, to corroborate, are hard to prove. So there's a lot to, to work on in terms of price and in terms of definition and confirmation. So how do you, how do you prove that? So if we address these two issues, the markets will grow really in an explosive way because there's been a meteoric rise in cyber events. That's it. Thank you, Vadim. So what's the uh, perspective of the regulator? Herman, the more financial services there are in the digital world, the more threats there could be. People are concerned not about cashbacks. People are more concerned about disruptions uh, at a particular bank. Will you regulate it, or will you hand it over to the insurance market? We will, definitely. I'll respond to a more sensitive issue. We will use pro rata regulation as a sort of proportionate one. Well, the level of digitalization is different uh, with the top 100 banks, uh, with the uh, top 10 banks. Yes, we you will use varied uh, 
or measured regulation for every credit and non-credit institutions will identify the processes that would need to meet certain security criteria. We'll identify KPIs and so we will keep track of them. And it's not we will distribute institutions uh, into credit, non-credit and credit into four types, basic license, non-banking, usual universal banks and uh, systemically important. Everyone will have their own KPIs. Here's one figure. The time of delay in money transactions is two hours for systemically important. And for basic banks, it's uh, for basic license banks, it's four hours. So two hours and four hours, as you can see, different criteria. I also mentioned some of the standards. There will be three levels of defense, minimum standard and enhanced. They also account for the size, uh, uh, the share of that uh, institution. So these are quite uh, you know, trans straightforward uh, indicators that we rely on. However, our customers need to get high-quality services 24-7, and they need to be have minimum risks, regardless of uh, whether it's a VIP client or it's an ordinary client. You need to provide safe uh, mobile apps, identification protocols, digital signature, etc. So any potential digital technology that individuals might face in their work and life. And uh, again, we all realize, and Vadim has uh, confirmed that uh, such security requirements are must-haves. Uh, it's a world trend. It's not just a whim by the regulator. And David mentioned that too. too. So definitely the operational resilience risk will be always out there. The more services you provide in a remote way, the higher the number of risks. And you cannot uh, you know, get rid of it uh, altogether. You can only mitigate it or minimize it. This is why we very much hope that uh, finance solutions will take it into account as part of their resilience uh, requirements. So apart from financial losses for the client and the organization, you might have uh, more consequences like contagion risks. Other ecosystem partners uh, could get the contagion, so outsourcing companies, vendors, and they would continue infecting everyone. And that domino effect could lead to unprecedented circumstances, even for uh, the banking industry in general in the most nightmare scenario. We also hope that on their side, the companies would take it into account. I don't feel we need to apply some extraordinary approach. What we need on the bank side, identify, respond, and quickly recover. That's it. Very simple. These are our principles. Now on insurance. Since the beginning of this year, there's been a, a kaleidoscope of statistics. Credit institutions say it's billions of losses. Uh, the Interior Ministry says hundreds of billions. The Prosecutor's Office uh, gives uh, their figures according to our data. It's about 10 billion. That's what is reported to us uh, in, by the credit institutions in their reports. So we can prove uh, our calculations. I don't know what uh, others and where others take their figures. There's a lot of uh, work outstanding. The person lost his, was robbed, uh, and they lost the the bank card, and uh, the robbers uh, got uh, the money from the bank card. And uh, the Interior Ministry qualifies this uh, not as robbery, but as cyber threats. Well, you know, bank card is usually a high-tech product. Well, insurance is all about math, actual uh, calculations, uh, long time series, and as Irina said, uh, there's more quality series in the West. We we'll also get this data. We do a lot of uh, data mining. We need to clean the data. Now we need to make them anonymous and then 
share it uh, with uh, our colleagues. We don't have the long time series. We won't be able to do what Vadim said. Otherwise, it's going to be just, uh, you know, a really um, haphazard uh, attempt. Uh, but regulation will be important. We'll try to help, and we definitely want uh, the industry to move towards uh, insurance and towards a better protection. We've got some comments. First question is to Irina. How popular is cyber insurance, particularly after the pandemic? What companies uh, get insurance uh, against these risks? Well, the pandemic has been a driver for uh, the insurance against uh, cyber threats. A lot of people and companies uh, went in telemode work, and the financial sector is ahead of the curve. And it's first the banks that it's primarily the banks that uh, get insurance against cyber threats, pharmaceuticals, retail chains, and uh, other chains that uh, have, like e-commerce chains. So if you have a lot of IT operations, you need that. And demand is growing. I agree that the Russian market is just a drop in the oceans, five. 100 million rubles, that's the size of the market. Vadim gave us uh, the total size uh, of the um, world market, but the Russian market is more modest. So we do see demand, but so far it's just uh, more about interest. Not many people buy uh, insurance plans. So it's just the, the biggest fish that uh, buy insurance. Vadim, a question to you. So you've got a disruption in your app. Who do we turn to? That's a question from the audience. Okay. If there's disruption, there are two channels of communication, call center or the bank's branch. Just go to the office. So here's what I would recommend. I don't know that social engineering is the curse of today's world. Uh, there are a lot of scamsters uh, here in Russia. I guess uh, that's a problem for other countries too. Definitely it's preferable to go to the branch to contact your manager to, to go physically to that uh, office. If there are some suspicious transactions, so you contact the call center and block. Uh, so I suggest you use official channels, the channels with maximum safety so that you know for sure that it's a bank. And don't believe anyone who would uh, call you back and say they are from the call center of the bank. Security of the bank, call center of the bank, the military ministry, the operations center, the calculations and the settlement center. If these individuals call you, don't believe them. You need to call, make a call. You need to make a call, not receive a call. You need to type in the number number that you can find on the official site. That's the only option. Herman, a question to you. Does the central bank believe that uh, mandatory uh, that insurance against cyber threats should be mandatory? Shall be mandatory? Well, it seems to be tempting, but we're not ready for this. We're happy to see you. More work done in this area, but we need more data. Without data, you cannot move forward. Insurance uh, pact is uh, consensus. The banks need to be aware of the pros, where they can save on it, and insurers need to know what's the target and where they earn on it. And as Vadim said, this is commercial activities and profit-making activities, and it's not charity. Every side wants to, every party wants to save something and earn something. So I'm sure it will become profitable going forward. We will work on it in a civilized uh, uh, way to solve these issues. Insurance companies uh, do have the data, they have these time series, and we now have a pilot project. An insurance company and several banks with a basic uh, license uh, are discussing a package, uh, a package solution. 
So that not every bank would have to buy, but it's going to cover all these banks. So that's the part of the project we're running right now. Let's go back to the our poll. Here's what our audience uh, says. Could you please bring it up? Not yet. Nadezhda, can I use this time to comment on what my colleagues said, particularly in Herman? OK, well, finally, we've got the data. Yes, Serena, I'll give you the floor in a second. Currently, at the moment, 58% of the audience believe this is the key threat for an institution, and only 37% uh, believe this has the same weight as other risks. I think that very much uh, speaks to the importance of uh, this agenda. Yes, on mandatory insurance. We, as an insurance company, fully support the regulator on this score. If there is a service that is imposed, that is forced upon the market participants, nothing good will come out of it. Clients would uh, have a stereotype that it's uh, something redundant, they don't need it, they'll try to you know, keep the price as low as possible, or you know, there could be moral hazard. You know, they would think uh, that everything is insured and they will just sit quietly, don't monitor the risks. And going back to what Vadim said on the rates, yeah, if the official mandatory rates uh, were calculated uh, in a bad way, in an incorrect way, then insurance companies will not uh, do that because they will not earn money, otherwise it's going, or it could be too expensive and the customers would try to evade this practice. So I fully agree with Herman. So I uh, hope they won't make it mandatory. It could just be an option uh, to, uh, re to reduce the re regulatory pressure, the regulatory burden. So if you have the cyber threat insurance, uh, maybe with a particular company, then investors might uh, look at some of the companies uh, with more active interest. So what are the indicators that uh, the bank and the client can use to see how the bank ensures its operational resilience. So what are the KPIs so that you can identify? Uh, question to David. What about international practice? Um, yeah, I think that that's an excellent question. And coming back to some of the challenges with respect to, to cyber insurance, one, one is, the I think, the difficulty in being able to assess policyholder vulnerabilities. I, I would invite you, there's been some stock taking done by the IAIS uh, on this very recently about the challenges. But but coming back to may, maybe I'll answer something different, not specifically K KPIs, uh, because this is uh, an area of, of, of a pretty uh, uh, intense debate among the central bank community. But but I think coming back to what uh, Herman had said, um, when we, we've done a pilot program with a number of central banks trying to assess their cyber resilience, and uh, I must stress that whether it's a proprietary or, or more of, a, of an international standard, those central banks that apply a security framework um, and also have a fairly robust three lines of defense tend, tend to be the ones that uh, come out very well when we do a cyber resilience assessment. So uh, I think it comes back to picking a specific cybersecurity framework. They're all a variation on a theme uh, making sure you institute those properly, take a look at the institutionalized, the practices around that. Um, and, and then I think um, with a fairly robust three lines of defense, th these are typically the institutions we see that fare very uh, much more favorably when it comes to an overall assessment of their cyber resilience, which I stress is just one component of operational resilience. Спасибо, uh, David. Thank you, David. Well, as a wrap-up, I could say that the market is growing steadily. It's great that uh, Russia has uh, 
been using digital services and they are really well developed. We just need clear, straightforward rules and regulation could lower the risks on the client side and provide a level playing field and uh, transparent rules for all the market participants and that would protect the interests of the companies and individuals. Well, we're working on it. Could you just give me a second? Well, the results of the poll have been positive. We've managed to convince the audience that is, uh, it's really relevant. At least 58% share this uh, understanding with us. And it means that we've been quite convincing. That's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for taking part uh, in this session. Thank you. Good